we are. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to jump right in. We are so grateful to have you all here. This is an artist chat. I'm Daniela, the artistic director of Rattlestick. If you feel comfortable, turn your videos on. We'd love to see you. Um, before we do anything, I do want to share our global land acknowledgement. And I just want to talk about why we do this. We want to acknowledge the space that we're on, the land that we're on, and we are actively trying to find ways to um, work and um, address the harms that have been done. So I'm going to read this. This will feel formal, um, but it's not meant to be. And um, we invite you to share the land that you are on right at, at this time as well. Um, we are hosted by Rattlestick Playwrights Theater, whose physical space stands on the unceded lands of the Lenape people. We recognize that in countless places in the world, Native peoples were abused, murdered, and forcefully removed from their lands by ideals and actions of land discovery and settler colonization. We recognize and respect all of the Native peoples all over the world. We invite every individual in this event to investigate the history of the land on which they stand and their Native peoples. Colonization is an ongoing process that still harms and destroys lives and cultures. And let us honor and respect and hold this space, open space, for all Native peoples past, present, and future. And this acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. So thank you for um, being a part of this event with us and taking that moment with acknowledging the land that you're on. Um, so the reason why I want you to um, share yourselves, your beautiful faces, is because I want to take a slight po a poll here and ask how many, if you feel like sharing yourselves, and no worries if you don't, you can just raise hand without sharing your, your, your view. Um, how many of you are actors who are here? What the hell? What the hell is going to put this down? Great. Thank you. And how many of you are writers? Great, thank you. And how many of you are actor writers? <laughs> that unique, wonderful, unique breed of folks. We have so many actor writers here. That is so wonderful. Um, so it is fantastic to be with all of you. And I also want to give a shout out to how many of you are just plain theater enthusiasts not theater practitioners, um, can you raise your hands as well? Just you being, not just about it, you being a theater enthusiast. Oh, wow, there aren't that many of you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, we are so grateful. And, you know, also I want to take a moment and appreciate those of you who were able to um, donate a little something to attend this event to make it possible for us to pay the artists and continue with all of our programming. So um, we really appreciate and thank you for your support of our work and our mission. Let's get to it. Um, I think I might have terrified the artists just now when I shared that our um, focus of this and how we're going to roll with this is that we periodically have actor writer salons and it's made up of little retreats where actor writers get together for a week and work on some material and we don't have an order for how people share people just share kind of based on who feels like sharing in the moment so there that is the way we're going to do it today um, so these seven artists are brave enough to follow this impromptu lead of they are just going to be sharing in whatever order they want. So the, I'll, I'm going to outline for you the flow of what you've agreed to be, participate in um, for the next hour and a half, which is there's going to be the sharing of work and every artist will be introducing and then sharing about five minutes of work. And then after that, there might be a little conversation about the work itself, just with the artists who are of our seven curated artists today. And then we're going to hold some time at the end to talk about what it means to be an actor writer, to wear both hats and to invite some questions from all of you. So that is the plan for our next bit of time together. And again, we are so grateful to all of you for being present here 
and I'm so grateful to these wonderful artists for their time and their care and their artistry. So um, I will also say that um, we invite people to share lines that resonate as people are reading their work in the chat. If you do that, make sure your mute button is on so we're not hearing you type. We do not invite criticism right now. I'm going to be very direct about this. This is new work for everyone. This isn't a critical, heavily critical space. This is a supportive space and a space to uplift and um, hold with love all of the work that these artists are sharing. So if I just want to like say that's a guiding principle and also not all the artists want you to chat lines that are resonant while they're sharing. And so that is up to each artist. And I will say in advance that Florencia, when you hear her piece, please do not be chatting about the piece as you're hearing it. Um, I think those are all of the housekeeping rules. Does anyone, we've never kind of done this before. So we've done a ton of artist chats, don't get me wrong, a lots of Zoom, but we've never quite done this thing. Um, does anybody have any questions or concerns before we roll? All right, make sure you're, if you're not sharing, go ahead and mute yourself. Um, unless the artist who's sharing wants you to unmute so they can get a verbal reaction. So again, we're gonna leave every artist to be in charge of how their own work is shared. So um, you, oh, and we'll put in the chat, if we haven't done already, the bios of these incredible artists, because I'm not gonna waste any more time blabbing at you. They're incredible. You should know them all. You should follow all of their work religiously and that's all I'll say there. Just trust me, they're all wonderful. Um, so, um, hi friends. I'm gonna leave it up to the seven of you to decide who feels like going first. And Guzzy, thank you so much. Hi gang. Um, I am in Gazangel. I use the pronoun she, her, hers. Um, I'm going to share um, a piece that I am working on. And I'm going to try and turn off my notifications because I don't know why I keep beeping. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a piece that I am working on uh, that I'm currently in process on, uh, one person show. Um, yeah, called The Last. That's the working title. Um, okay, I'm just gonna start in the middle because I like to start in the middle. Mm. I don't know why, of course people want to bother you when you're doing things, okay. Um, if I told you I had a dream about you, would that freak you out? I mean, I know I've already told you, so people used to be flattered by that, by being the stuff dreams are made of by being in my dreams, but now I can't say things like that. I, I'm not a dream. I'm not magical. I'm a real person. I know that. Sorry, I, 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 I don't mean to. I didn't mean to. What was I saying? I was saying, I think about you when we were good. Do you remember that? Of course not. Can you think back that far? I only need you to for like a second and then you can go back to hating me or however it is that you feel or whatever it is that's making you render this a one-way convo. I remember we used to talk. I mean, we used to really spill our guts to each other. First day we met, remember? You came to me. You came to me. Remember? And you just started yammering on. Not that I didn't like it. I, I don't want to make it seem like you bothered me. I was hoping you would talk to me, actually. I was like, who is this, this person? And you sat next to me and you said, hey, and I said, hey, and you smiled at me. And I'm not going to lie, the way that you were just too comfortable with me, the first time we met was kind of, well, it was kind of sus, but you didn't care. You just looked at me and told me how lucky we were to meet each other, that if you're lucky, if you play your cards right, that this might be the best thing that ever happened to you. And I took a deep breath and I said, okay. And we didn't know each other and you held my hand and I couldn't breathe when you touched me. It was weird. I could have came right there. I know you don't want to hear that, but you were all I wanted, I swear. And now, well, that seems like make-believe, you know? It feels like I made you up, like I made us up. Did I make us 
is that real? Are you real? I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm just, I'm trying to work it out. Did we go through this piss and shit to just end up here? I mean, I mean, what the fuck? Sorry. Sorry, I know you hate it when I, sorry, I just, I'm trying to figure out how, how we got to where I am. We got there, right? It wasn't just me that fucked up, was it? Did I, did I lie to you? Should I have told you who I was before I held your hand, before I took that breath? but you didn't seem like you wanted to know. That didn't seem like a part of the agreement, like a part of the deal. Is there a part of the context that I was missing? Did I miss something? I feel like you didn't ask, like there was an unspoken from here on out, forget about before, fuck before, there is no before, before is trash. There was just now, you didn't wanna know all the before shit. At least that's what it felt like. Like you didn't want to know who I was. I mean, what kind of person doesn't ask questions? I mean, how can you be mad at me now? There had to be some deep part of you that knew. You knew you had to have known who I was. I thought you knew. I thought you could see who I was. How could you not see? How could you not see who I was? I should have said something. I know it's not your fault. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I thought you knew me. But I guess we were both kidding ourselves, or maybe I just saw what I wanted to see, someone who would forgive me, forgive all the things I had done, someone who would absolve me. That's what I wanted to see, someone who didn't care, someone who didn't have that agape. I just learned that term. Agape means unconditional or some shit. Did you teach me that? Who can remember anymore? Anyway, it doesn't matter because that shit's not real. We all have conditions, directions, instructions, incantations, spells. You, you put a spell on me. I, I can't keep blaming you. I'm sorry. Can I just put my hand in yours? No? Okay. Please? 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 Okay, then I'll just put my hand out. Okay. Okay, that's okay. I deserve that. How long do you think this will last, this thing between us, this distance, this chasm, this wall, this, this? How long? Just tell me how long? Never mind, I don't care. That's it. That's all we're going to share. <laughs> Can we unmike ourselves to give Cuzzy some love here, please? Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Sharing new things, scary, but lovely. Yeah. <laughs> really beautiful. Oh, God. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Jesus, I didn't want it to end. Yeah. <laughs> It Thank doesn't you. for 30 pages, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's like three pages of Whoa. it. Like... I was really, I was totally with you the whole way. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Really beautiful. Thank you, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, and yeah, thank yeah. you, friends, for those of you who shared some lines in the chat below. Um, who would like to go next? I'll go. Thank you. Um, yeah, do I need to do anything? Uh, oh, I need to tell, I need to tell you about myself. Hi, I'm Mahira and uh, um, she, her, hers pronouns. Um, and this is, well, you tell me what you think this is about. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna start. Recipe. One helping of small spaces divided amongst 12 people, four of whom are poor. As many resentments as you wish, the older the better. Aged ones add more flavor. Thin, threadbare towels given to your daughter-in-law. A liberal splash of violence. Add in the shards of broken plates if you wish, eight servings of helplessness, four seeds of oppression, four strands of mania, alcoholism, depression, add as much noise as you can handle, and then more. A fistful of jealousy, skimp on compassion, kindness, quiet restraint. Mix it all together. You will need to use both fists, 
you will really have to get in there and knead as hard as you can. Don't worry about the shards cutting you or the sweat dripping off your forehead. The more blood and perspiration that is added, the better. Once it's all blended, you might need to back away. The mixture might fizz and pop, royal. Bake it at a high temperature. The hotness of your mother's backhand imprinted on your cheek or the heat of your grandfather's temper when he hit your father so hard on the back, his retina detached. It will come out rock solid and perhaps gray or green. Eat it, eat it whole. Swallow it with a glass of the belittlement your mother dished out. Remember when she said she was ashamed to call you her daughter, that she wept when you were born a girl, or that her love for you would erode, or that she wished you would commit suicide? It'll help the rock go down easier. It won't be pleasant. There will be tearing along the way, but you need to ingest it. Let it sit in your stomach. The acids will break it down. No, you couldn't have swallowed the ingredients separately not for the task that needs doing. Your stomach might distend and bloat or concave in. There is not enough data out there to predict what will happen. So your best recourse is to grin and bear it. Let the rock take as long as it wants to disintegrate, take root. One day you will find a tree growing out of your mouth, the branches reaching for the sky. This might not be a good thing, you will look pretty and unusual, and people will stop to take photographs. But remember, you will be carrying around a tree growing up your esophagus, and the weight of it will tilt your head back, and you won't be able to speak or swallow or breathe much. Do it anyway. When the branches reach up to the sky, proclaiming themselves as bigger than you, and little yellow birds twitter and land on the branches, and people point to it, mumble through the twigs and leaves stuffing your mouth. This is my family tree. Isn't it beautiful? I couldn't breathe in the house I grew up in. When I say I couldn't breathe in it, I mean the air always felt thick and cloying like I had been dropped right into the middle of a dense flourless chocolate cake and I was trying to dig my way out. Years later, a sports therapist would remark that I breathed shallow and that I might want to take a closer look at that. The body carries a history. The body does not lie. The body remembers well. I'm not a victim. Please believe me when I say I use all these stories now to propel me forward. When people ask me why I became an actress, I say there was a high drama quotient in my family. This is the language my mother would use. And thank you, therapist, friends, recovery, for the grace and space in my soul that allows me now to laugh at it. She would say, I wept when you were born because you weren't born a boy. I confronted her with this years later, and first she denied this, and then said my grandmother's friends had made her feel guilty, so she wept. And she only told me this when I was six years old because she needed to offload her version of getting it off her chest. My mother also said she would be like Narasimha, the lion god, and rip her brother's skin off and make his blood run in the streets. No, really, I have the text where she said that. She, <laughs> she said that because her brother went on Facebook and wrote a whole lot of vituperative nonsense, particularly about her. And my mother doesn't like being shown up. To be clear, she didn't get this angry when I told her about him molesting us as children, but my mother cares a lot about social cachet and how she is perceived, and Facebook is a public forum. Sometimes I think my sister and I left to live on the other side of the world just so we wouldn't have to deal. When I was in the third grade, I snuck a comic book into my textbook in class and read it while the teacher taught math. She caught me and scolded me, but what I had read had shaken me so much that I started bawling. She thought I was crying because of her, but I was crying because a story I had read was about Jesus in comic book form. I learned about all my gods and goddesses this way. Every Indian child of my generation was exposed to Amar Chitra Katha, a series of comic books which told the stories of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana and the whole panoply of deific beings the world over. So my first exposure to Jesus was through this comic book and it was graphic. They didn't spare the blood or the crown or the thorns or the nails. They really dug into the depiction. 
I still remember they took an entire page to show him nailed to the crucifix with all the clumpy gore dripping down his sides, his bone-like ribs sticking out, poor head bent in pain. I couldn't stand it, and I didn't understand why people were being so cruel to somebody who just wanted to help people. Had any proselytizers been around, they could have plucked me right then. I was so very ripe for the picking. But nobody wanted to convert me, and I returned home, mulling over the story in my little head with nobody really to talk about it. I tell you this because I have a complicated relationship with capital G God, which might seem weird because I grew up with gods all around me and assuming they were just part of everyday life. Once I started to read, and I was a voracious reader who devoured hordes of the Amritsar Kathas, and in them the gods were depicted as playing, sleeping, pooping, having sex. They seemed so knowable, so everyday, just, you know, with superhuman powers. My neighbor, Meghna, and I played gods and goddesses almost every day. One day she was Krishna and I was one of the cowherd women running away from him. More on Krishna's slight rapiness later. And one day I was Shiva roaring through the forest and she was Ganesh trying to block me from entering to see his wife. Ganesh was the OG cock blocker. And there were gods in every street corner in Calcutta. And I grew up near a mosque where the Muezzin used loudspeakers to call the faithful to prayer five times a day. All gods seemed such a part of our lives that when we complained about mosques, and mosques are a touchy subject now in India, it was mostly to say that the Muezzin was really besura, which means he couldn't hold a note. And we wished for a sweeter voiced man. Uh, thank you so much, Mahira. Um, please unmute yourselves, everybody, and share some love. <laughs> Thank you so much. It just rang true because I, I'm cleaning out my closet and in <laughs> in a tub I found this from my second grade. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and if anybody needs anything, give me a call. I have a lot of stuff here, man. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Thank yeah, it's you. so beautiful. It's got some like remnants of like, it just feels like the ing like the painful ingredients for growing up. You know what I mean? Like some of those things will like cut you on your way out. Some of the things that you have to ingest and take in. You know what I mean? Will sort of cut you open on your way out. But those are the those are the ingredients for growing up the way that you did. So it's it's gorgeous. And so just, just the resilience uh you know when you said and someone put it in the chat like trust all of these stories are propelling me forward because it's so painful like some of the some of the things you're told but like the the ferocity of like oh no no i'm gonna make this work for me is that was goddess energy right there and it was it was thrilling to to be to be on that journey with you yeah, along those lines, I felt the same way. I felt that there was a lusciousness in your, uh, in the violence. There was a luscious language that was talking about pain. It transformed the pain to something else. You know, that's the feeling I had. That image of the tree growing out of the mouth, I, that one just got me stuck. Oh. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, that was beautiful. Really beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for these popcorn comments, friends. Um, who would like to go next? I'll go. Thank you. Um, so my name is Florencia Lozano. Um, and I am dedicating this to uh, moms. Um, Craig Grant uh, passed away. Um, he, he was also known as Mums or Sir Mumsala. And um, there was a very, very deep and beautiful uh, uh, memorial that the um, Bowery poetry uh, did for him. Um, there were some king and queen philosopher poets who memorialized him. Uh, Liza Jesse Peterson, uh, Tara Turk Hay, Saul Williams, 
Wood Harris, La Bruja, Mike Ladd, Brad Walrand, Willie Perdomo, so many. But Rick Medina, who was um, who DJed Soccer MC, uh, which was a show that Mums did and was slated to do this summer, and that I, I hope that production still goes on, said that Mums always wanted to know what the last thing was you wrote, right? So uh, this is the last thing that I wrote, and it is not about um, it, this is not about Mums but it is about um, regret surrounding the death of another fallen giant. Um, that's probably not gonna be the title of it, but for right now it is. Here's what I mean to say, not to be mean, just to say, just, 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 is it not quite, don't really mean it, or don't have to make space for it. I'm kind of sort of, but not really. It's just, just, it's just, just, justice. Justice demands, I say, and by say, I mean right. And by right, I mean mean. Don't be mean, don't, don't, don't. Fear stops me here. Are you still there? What I said before, that time you stopped listening, remember, because it came out wrong, remember? Maybe you don't, and maybe it didn't come out wrong, but it felt like it didn't, so I revisit it here. Here, I think it through on the page in the hopes of getting through to you. We have a history of abusive white male directors, which really just makes us like everyone else. Who you ask? Shit, I say, fuck, no way. They'll nail me to the wall. They already hate me for having raised a stink. Something stinks, all right. Something rotten in the state of your location here. Now, listen here, if you haven't already stopped listening, my dear, it doesn't make us special, it's just, there I go again. And that's just it, isn't it? The uncertainty, my uncertainty for certain it must be, my trepidation, fear of reprisal. I have heard stories of how our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So hallowed in fact, it mustn't dared be said. Oh, the dread father was using. That is my understanding. And maybe I misunderstood, but what I understood to be true is that our father was abusive when he fell off the wagon. No one dared step in and stop his behavior, which is in fact the way of the world and is of course part of a much larger problem. Some of us were hiding under tables is my understanding. When he'd come around to give his opinion, I was terrified of our father and desperate to steer clear of his wrath. And I'm wondering, can we so many years later, come out and talk about this? I mean, can we name this injury and recognize that we suffered from it? In silence, in dread whispers, in back room, back of the back conversations, speaking for myself, I was a coward with a capital C. I saw our father once, and you know the reason I call him that, is that we worshiped him. Is that too strong? I'll speak for myself, I did, I worshiped him. I think I still might. He has the answers, the way, the truth to, to how we do what we do, how to be the best at doing what we do. That's what complicates matter, don't it just? That we loved him and he loved us. Now, of course, speaking solely for myself and my relationship to our father, or let's just call him, <laughs> he and I did not trust one another. I proved myself on several occasions to be a goddamn idiot, and he had responded in kind. When I showed up to an audition, which I arrogantly thought I'd nail, he told me he didn't think I loved my boyfriend. How many times I've replayed that moment and wish I had responded, this character doesn't have a boyfriend because what the heck did it matter what he thought of my personal life? It struck a nerve, his comment, and that was, I suspect, his MO. He struck a nerve and crippled me like the weakest in the herd. I had gotten high before the audition, so of course that worsened the situation. He was convinced I could not play this part and he told me so. I crumpled like the greasy napkin he fingered as he ate a piece of pizza during the audition. Oh, how I wish I'd swallowed my tears and attacked back. Oh, yeah? Well, I think you eat too much pizza, you fat fuck. I really, really wish I had said that. He did not want to work with me. I did not know why. Although years and years later, I have some good guesses. Guesses is all. Gassy guesses. I do not pride myself on being right anymore. My point is, he could do whatever he wanted and no one would stop him. So, you argue, so? You hate me too. He was brilliant. No argument. He abused his power, I'd argue, and he was cruel and followed that old school, do whatever you have to do to get to the truth. The ends justify the means, do they? Then after he relapsed, no one could get to him, could reach him, and he remained the boss in our house. 
He spanked my ass once after he saw me perform. I was mortified in the moment and angry. How fucking dare he? I'd later come to learn that this was his way of expressing admiration and respect. He had done it to women and men. I imagine, actually, he'd done it more to men than to women. I wish I'd known that. I wish I'd been in the in group, the group he trusted and wanted to work with so I could have known that and taken pride in the ass slap. Is that a strange thing to wish? I also don't wish I'd been in that group because that way of working feels damaging to me, but maybe that's just sour grapes. He told me once that blah, blah, bloody bloopy, bloody bloopy bloop with a laugh at the end. A laugh, I recognize now that it's too late, was him reaching out. Hashtag regret. I took it your word here. The wrong way, as an offense, I regret missing the moment of him reaching out to me with laughter. I resented him for not wanting to know what was underneath my fucking bed. He was frightened, I think, and so was I. I wish I'd had compassion for him in that moment, for myself. We never resolve shit, and now he's gone. Part of me is glad that he's dead. I'm ashamed of that thought. Part of me feels vindicated, as in, you don't trust me? You died of a drug overdose, so who's the untrustworthy one in this equation? I'm still here, motherfucker. I bring him up, our father, as an example, my monsters, because he's one example, and there are more, of the ways in which even we, founded as we were in reaction to white supremacy, even we have been infiltrated, inundated by the sickness of the world in which white means power, unchecked power, and where male means authority, with an emphasis on author, which I'd argue, though I'd really rather not argue, has always been our struggle. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. So I was like fucking with the way that your constant use of like just, just, you know what I mean? Like just like does this justify the ends? The end? You know what I mean? Like it's just like I was like, yeah, I was feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> Mums forever, also. Mums forever, man. Yes. yes. Mums Mom. forever. I, I don't think I would have read this if it weren't for him. Like I feel him near me whispering like fucking go for it whispering like mm. always courageous mm. <laughs> always courageous thank you so much for sharing Flo. um everyone was with you while mm. they were listening to you um who would like to share next oh cc okay go ahead cc <laughs> CC then Jane. Hi, I'm Lucy Papa. I'm Lucy Papa. Um, this is a piece. Um, it's it's so funny because, whew, this is a piece that um, moms and I discussed um, four years ago when we did a small little show off Broadway. Um, so it's titled "Things That Were Said to Me." No time nor place to be reckless anymore. I need to strive for regardless. The bounties of freedom for me is priceless. Eight whole years on a 10 year sentence. All that is lost now. All that I can't regain now. Struggling to find some grace, shunning the traps for the correctional rats, which would ring us in, which would spread us thin. The red, the red blinking lights on these prison wall battlegrounds means we should be ready for the war in here. Some of us are wiser and stronger than what you think because we're not afraid to show who we are. I would cringe when the correctional officers would call me he. They will never know the peace of acceptance I'm at today. Life in here was harsher than the dirt. My parents made me feel worthless because I wanted to wear a dress because I felt different. I was cut off, disowned, disbowered. The one family member after another family member disappears. No one hears my sobs or sees my salty tears. 
The clock cuts me bitterly, condemning me to be lonely while I cry all the more. I'm the son wanting to be a daughter who was falsely accused for a crime I did not commit. I am no longer the shady firm of heartbeats when issues of hate against my trans sisters are comically displayed in the media like there's something to judge, snicker or laugh at. I'm exhausted. My whole life trying to force myself not to be who I really am for the sake of society and its own hocus pocus bullshit. I was told by a CEO in here, you can't be a black tranny and a fucking Christian. God does not accept those people into his kingdom. As I laid in a dark cold between those prison walls, all I could do was me being in there, overwhelmed by depression and great despair, feeling sorry for myself, thinking this is not fair. How did I get here? What did I do? Why me? I'm fighting for my life in here. As I sit here today, watching the bright blue skies of freedom, I realize my life is so full of obstacles. The more I strive to be me, to fit in, to feel safe, to be accepted, the better chance of starting a new life, a new her. Some time has gone by like a parade, finally released from the battlegrounds of those prison walls. I live only with the memory and tears that fall. The end of my journey is now a sh sight, and from all the darkness, I can finally see the light. I have the war card to show it's been tough, but, but from that hard, bitter lesson, wrong place at wrong time, I was slammed and told, read what you sow because of who you are. I write letters to my mama each week throughout my years to try to despair my earlier fears. Friends and members would forget you and never want you again. I knew it happened. Wish I could spare them the pain. For those who forsake me while away, I give them no thought. But I'm home now, stronger and wiser, I feel. All my heartaches and heartbreaks will eventually heal. The younger me will meet the newer me each day. Temptations will come, but it's time to be strong. I remember the first and what I didn't do wrong. I stand here and ask you really want to be locked up again and put your loved ones through more terrible pain. I'm not so religious as I should be. I only pray in the emergency, but he'll answer my prayers during my time of pain and see my life through to a fruitful end. The end. Yes. 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 Yeah, there's a beautiful, actual, like, mm. soft fierceness in it. Beautiful. Yeah. Really beautiful. Mm. Strength. Mm. Yes, yeah. you don't have to be loud to be powerful. Mm. Powerful is right. Yeah, really beautiful. It comes from the depths. That's the feeling I have. It comes from the depths. Thank you. Thank you for your courage, too, and sharing that here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, James, moving over to you. Yes, sir. Hello. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm going to share, just like everybody else, I guess, a work in progress. It's from a piece called Bravado. Um, and it is the very beginning of the piece. Um, it is the very opening of the piece. It's a piece um, about viruses and 9-11 and death and mortality and how badly we process it here in America. And I'm going to start off with the with a Zoom blackout, so don't get scared. I think often about how I am perceived. What people see when they look at me. I used to think I could control it. It being the image that you see when you look at me. 
I thought that if I got a nice, fresh haircut and I wore clean, classic clothing and spoke clearly using only actual English language without street slang, that I could control your perception of me, that I could convince you that I'm a good person, that I'm not a threat, that I am someone you should like. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. I've learned that no matter how good, no matter how kind you think you are, if you live long enough, you will enter a room and someone will look at you and immediately dislike you. It takes a mere seven seconds for most people to form an impression of you. If you've never seen me before in my countdown, you were consciously or unconsciously forming an impression of me based strictly on your own assumptions. Unfortunately, these seven second totally subjective impressions can formidably shape how you interact with the person before you, short or long-term. Facial shape, clothing style, posture, perceived race greatly affects what you think about the person you are presented with. Some of you, hopefully a very small percentage of you, looked at me and immediately saw someone that you were ready to dislike, to disdain, to distrust. If that is how you process the initial image of me, it would be a great obstacle for me to overcome, especially since I would probably have no idea that you felt the above. Bravado. The piece you've decided to encounter is largely about how we fear or accept mortality and how we process, nurture, and act on the intense emotional experience of hatred and how left alone, it can fester and how when encouraged, it can motivate us to act out greatly on its influences. The virus of hatred was the engine influencing those who perpetrated the horrific series of events that occurred on 9-11-2001. Viruses spill over. Biological viruses like rabies spill over from one species to another. Rabies, for example, can pass from dogs to humans. Rabies enters a dog, reproduces itself, situates itself in the dog's saliva, and influences the dog, making its primary purpose to bite anything and everything so that it can be transmitted to another host. The metaphorical virus of hatred acts similarly to a biological virus in that it infiltrates, makes a home in its host and proceeds to greatly influence. The virus of hatred spilled over into the peaceful religion of Islam and the tiny percentage of jihadists involved in the 9-11 catastrophe who claim the peaceful religion of Islam as their own hated all things American and executed an elaborate plan ending in death, carnage, and terror. The surprising result was a loving coming together of Americans. Based on the fact that my ancestors were brought here against their will and enslaved, my level of patriotism is dim. But after 9-11, there was a coming together I found difficult to resist, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Right now, I just want to impart on you the fact that hatred was and is a strong virus that it can greatly influence one to perpetrate incidents that can surprise even oneself. I believe that one cannot hate or greatly fear anyone or anything that one understands. My intention with this work is to foster understanding of two disparate facts. One, death is a part of life. And two, 
Hate is a destructive emotion that dies when understood. Thank you. Terrific. Yes. Very beautiful. Right now. All right now. James. Very really beautiful. James. My love the last line. I love the last line. Understanding. Mm. Mm -hmm. The virus of hatred. Damn. My intention is understanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need this show. Like we need, we need it to consume. Okay. <laughs> you need to get in shape, honey, because that's. I love hatred disappears when it's understood. It's yeah, amazing. that was my line. <laughs> Beautiful. Love Beautiful. it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing, James. Go big or go home, folks. You know. <laughs> What incredible artists, what incredible sharings. Um, we have two remaining artists to hear from, Rob and Keith. Which one of you wants to go if next? you want to go last, right? All right, Rob, it is you. Okay, so I'll go. Okay, this is, uh, I, I just want to thank Rattlestick because the last thing I did uh, was really helpful and ended up, it's going to be published, it's a book but it was so helpful uh, and you guys are so inspiring. Um, and this is a new book. So it's called um, To Find Home and I'll just jump into it. Um, <clears throat> it was way too late at night and Rodney was in a lousy section of Washington Heights getting high on stuff he shouldn't have been shooting with people he shouldn't have been with, but that was the glam of it all, the freedom and new life of it all at 17. He hated everything about the Park Avenue he lived on and the stately mausoleumness of it and the swells that lived there, walking about full of themselves with their tan complexions, custard hair, and moneyed poofery. They always looked at him weird. This made him feel on the outs. They weren't real. But now he was in a den of too real where he shouldn't be and didn't belong. Death came easily here. It was a casual flick, a second of not paying attention, an overdose. People either belong places or they don't. He was a way too white boy in a room with no white boys that did not, did not belong in this shooting gallery. And some small part of him should have been squirming about the fentanyl-laced heroin being spiked into his veins. But it wasn't. After Nestor, the Jewish and Puerto Rican proprietor who ran the joint dosed him, Rodney managed to kind of thank you nod, roll back on a rotting couch, his head in an opioid fumigation haze. He could feel his heart race, then decrease to a throb in seconds, the colors in his brain quietly, vividly blooming, abstract geometric shapes, his perception of the world now a jazzy, cool calm. It was so lovely not to feel angry, floating in a warm sea. He could check out like his dad did when his mom yelled at him on Park Avenue. He always saw it true when it happened, she would explode like a bomb and his dad would just go away. His body was there, but he just became this thin film of himself, a foggy outline with a kind of zigzaggy and a gog soul. What a groovy dimension he was in now, he thought. No blame or hate or wanting something else or the agitation of wanting or praying to be somewhere else. The now was where to be, he thought, the present here, even here in this place that could use a paint job and some new furniture, maybe some pictures on the wall, but maybe not. Maybe this place that smelled of piss and lavender was its own cool ecosystem that by itself was going back to the natural Adam and Eve of things. Rodney writhed blissfully with these thoughts, but there were so many of them that he had to keep his body moving as if to both catch and ingest them into his own organism, his own spirit, so he could experience and comprehend them fully and not forget them when the high wore off. The fentanyl heroin combo was coming on even stronger, sizzling his brain down to specific puddles of ancient memory banks. And Rodney's dream found itself back in an old camp of his, and he was seven years old with the cool camp criminal kids who were planning a major heist from the arts and crafts workshop where all the cool stuff was. Beautiful colored stones, pale blue, blood orange, gold flecked, hairline marbled crimson, sky purple, some smooth, some craggy burnt pieces of wood, some carpentry shit, tools even. 
But before any of it got taken, the oldest kid, the guy in charge and mastermind of this enterprise was giving out criminal nicknames so no one would call anyone by their real names because that's what real criminals did. Rodney had a singular and rare talent. He could twist the fingers on his left hand into practically any shape that was anatomically impossible and the results were ghoulishly stunning. A pinky sandwich with a pinky twisted onto its side and the index and ring fingers curled tightly on top. A reverse spine looking thing with fingers curled on top of each other backwards. Nails and fingers curled into each other forward so that the second knuckles of the index, middle and ring finger, ring and pinky fingers look like bald ranging lions facing front and the tips of the fingers turn angry fire engine red because the circulation was cut off. It was because of this gift of bizarre and noteworthy fingership that the leader of the group, the criminal genius who aspirations it was to take over the camp and lead it to the dark side, to conquer all the naysayers who naysayed him, that he bestowed upon Rodney the name Fingers. And he just looked at Rodney and said simply, and we'll call you Fingers. Rodney might as well have been knighted. It was all Rodney could do not to drop to his knees. He was bursting with pride and wonder at this gift of fortune, such as the breath of criminals. It gave him a brief but fiercely proud identity. Fingers now rolled around on the gross couch, flooded with dope and pride and swelling memories, mumbling, mumbling smilingly, I am fingers, I am fingers. Nestor lovingly touched the top of Rodney's sweating forehead with his middle finger as a father would to his son. Not that Nestor would know what it was like to have a father because his father left after initial insertion, but he had always wanted his own son to hang with, to teach, to take care of, to protect, to endure, and had fantasized about one, but the chips hadn't gone that way so far. And that's about five minutes. That's what we got. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's into the first chapter, so. That's the first chapter? Dang. <laughs> no. Yes, we agree yeah. on the first chapter, but I don't know. We'll see what happens with it. But anyway. Oh, in of two real. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks. I am fingers. I am fingers. I am fingers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> see all those fingered. Yeah. I just could say with this story, like, I could tuck in and I just want to be on this ride. Um, oh, good. Well, maybe mm -hmm. they'll buy this one too. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much Thank for And thanks for the opportunity. It's great to read this stuff out loud to you guys. You guys are amazing too. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Very Thank much. you. So um, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next. Keith is oh. going to go next. Can't oh. do that. And then after that, we're going to dive into a conversation about how the heck are you actor writers? How do you wear both hats? And, um, and that there will be time for friends to, who are listening to throw some questions into the chat and the like. Um, but first and foremost, Keith, over to you. Uh, hey, uh, Keith, KRS, that's me. Um, Okay, I don't need to say anything. Uh, timer. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I want you to feel this. Why couldn't you just love me? I needed you. I wanted you. You know how many times I acted out because you weren't there? I was always trying to find ways for you to see me. The squeaky wheel, you know. Are you glad that you were born? I'm not. I'd rather not to have ever been born than to feel this pain that I have felt for as long as I can remember. Am I dying? Am I? Am I looking at a black butterfly? Is it really there? 
What the hell you got? I'm here for you. I see you. My name is Ellie. Do you like her? I love their music. You check that jam hard place. Ooh, that bout sounds like this situation. Can't go back now. That's a lot of red. Having everything revealed is what's about to happen. I ain't gonna get into woulda, coulda, shoulda. You don't have to be afraid. I got you. Now, there is going to be an attempt at reclamation, but that's not what you want. I, I gotta go, but I'll be back in 10. Be careful of Carmen. Okay, that was bizarre. Am I losing my mind? Maybe I'm dreaming, though it feels real. Why couldn't he just walk in right now and make up for his benign neglect by saving me. Hello? Hello? I'm Carmen. You can call me found and lost. Well, that's a fascinating moniker. You look like a rat. Thank you. It means I'm smart. Uh, do you also have a message? As a matter of fact, I do. First, you're not smart. You're speeding down a one-way street in the opposite direction as the flow. Has Ellie been here or Delilah? Ellie. They are pretty. Most people never seen a black butterfly. Attention getting lives for the music. Me, on the other hand, I like using my mind, solve puzzles, play chess, love architecture. I can help you. You wanna go back? I'm done. I tried to help him, but he could never understand that this was no ordinary love. Good enough soul, but doesn't understand that life is in relationships thinks that meaning is found in things. When he wakes up, he's gonna fall hard and regrets are not the burden that one wants to carry. Damn, it's cold. I wish I had some Dodge. Okay, here's the deal. That's an awful lot of blood on the ground. You probably have a finite number of breaths left. Did you write a note? You probably aren't going to be found until you start smelling. I'm really mad at you though, though I don't know you. Permanent solutions for temporary problems. It's a memo on myself. Maybe I can come back. What do you want to come back as? Hummingbird. Outstanding. Messengers treading and healing peace. Do you worship? What do you mean? Do you practice meditation? Pray. No, I'm uh, what? Done. The end. I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Yeah. All right, man. Thank you. Uh, beautiful work. Let's take a moment and yeah. just un unmute ourselves and just give a big round of applause to these incredible seven artists. And Thank their you. wonderful vision. Thank you, everybody. And you just saw a taste of the generosity in which they speak about one another's work. And I think 
this idea about being in community together and what does it mean to be in community together and show up and listen deeply to one another's work and have courage and sharing and all of those things are just so many things that you saw here in addition to hearing such really powerful pieces. So um, we're so grateful to all of you. So I'm gonna ask just one question. Anyone can answer it in any order they like. And then I'm gonna, um, you know, the chat is open for anyone that has a question to throw into the chat. I think that might be the easiest way rather than raising a hand, um, just given the time that we have. So how are you actors who write? You know, what part of you is actor? What part of you is writer? How do you balance the balance? Um, what is your process of balancing the balance? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and anyone can really take that question. Um, I feel like I don't really balance. Like, I feel like I kind of let all the plates fall and <laughs> pay attention to the plate that's spinning and go, oh, I guess I'm doing this one now. Um, <laughs> that's kind of how I work it. Um, I kind of am more trained as an actor and was doing and has and have pursued acting at its most, but it feels like where I'm at at the moment, writing has pursued me. Um, and so I'm just going along with that thing and writing for me is I don't think I'm a control freak but it is the thing that I have the most control over um and so it feels like I'm pursuing that sort of um vocation at the most because it is the thing that is also pursuing me um and then if I have that acting itch that acting scratch I'll just write something and like share it you know mm -hmm. It's, it's funny. I don't, um, I don't, I don't, I see myself mostly as a writer and I write stuff for myself. And then as a result of that, sometimes people say, James, can you do this? And for me, cause I don't have it. I, you know, like I just, I have so much, uh, admiration for actors who can go in there and have people look at you and go, uh, <laughs> no, 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 I don't think so. <laughs> Like, I um. like, so I, um, I I write for myself and, and when I write for myself and I perform sometimes people come up to me and be like you know I've got something you might want to do you know yeah one thing I'll just throw out there is that um because I I'm with Ngozi on uh, in terms of balance is uh, you know every day every week kind of the changes and it's it's a real struggle to, to balance things um but you know I, I love it when i can make an equation in my life which is either way i win so i try to play this mental game on myself which is like if i have an acting gig which you know pays a little money um because that's what i mostly do for money uh, or an audition to work on great and if i don't great because that means i can i can write you know so i'm always sort of like i i always feel that i uh i can do something you know i don't have that feeling of like oh god like I, there's nothing you know um and and uh and i love that about about having both things going on in life Does anyone else want to jump in? Because we have other questions going in the chat. Um, so if anyone else wants to jump into this question, I'll give you space. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say that uh, I'm, I, I go through the world uh, through, uh, with acting means. Uh, so that is uh, what I, I consider my ministry. Uh, the writing is what I do for myself, and it's very personal, and uh, I try to write every day, and I got uh, a lot of different things. 
Uh, uh, I'm going to ask, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm going to ask friends, if you're not talking, to go ahead and mute yourselves, just because we're getting a little bit of feedback. Um, and then go ahead and, and unmute. And, sorry, go ahead, Keith. Uh, I was just saying that I write for myself. And it's just a, a way to uh, put the thoughts and feelings that I have and impressions that I see around me uh, in a place. Uh, so the acting is the ministry. The, uh, uh, the writing is uh, uh, joy. Um. I don't, I think what Aunt Goldie said about not, you know, balance, I, th I think I second that. Um, but I'm also, com I, you know, I worked recently with a director who said it was sort of life changing and she said, you have to tell your own stories. And I know so many, so many wonderful actors internationally and just, um so i guess i just feel like um i when i think about representation which is such a tricky freighted loaded word i think about what speaks to me and what i want to see my friends doing so i think when i write it's in my voice but i imagine my friends performing it and um and uh and so I try to write a little bit every every week, and I try to keep the bar really, really low so that I don't uh, beat myself up. Um, we have a bunch of questions in the chat, so I want to honor those, too. And, you know, folks answer certain questions, and we'll move on, and, answer, and other folks might answer another one. Answer the questions you all feel passionate about answering. There's some questions about um, writing processes. Um, X Alexander Durden was talking, how do you remain objective in the editing process of your own writing? Um, Jason Brown was talking about, I heard a lot of stream of consciousness flow in a lot of the work. Is that how you initiate the writing process? So I think these are sort of questions to demystify how you approach your process. Um, if, if either of you want to, if any of you want to respond to either of these specific questions, um, you know, please, I'm, I'm throwing the ball out there. Um, thank you for these inspiring questions. I would love to talk about process. Um, I'm a process guy. Um, and, and what I do is, is I kind of, I literally like see myself as like, like um, this, like as a computer in the world is a computer and, and my, my, um, my project is my desktop and I view everything. I, I bring everything into my world and I'm like, I, I look at everything and say, well, would this work? Would that work? Everything I read uh, becomes a part of my story. Most of it doesn't get in there, but I'm constantly uh, in my head, I'm constantly writing. I cannot face a blank page. I don't know how people do that. You know, it's like, uh, that is like nightmare shit for me. So when I get at the computer, I got a ton of stuff in my head and I'm like, I'm downloading, you know? Um, so that's, that's my process. Does anyone else want to tackle the process question? And um, Cece, can you unmute yourself? If not, we'll we'll try to fix the technical problem. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <laughs> um, the way I guess I, I handle my process is I really write from my experiences. Um, I write from um, others' experiences. I write. Uh, uh, I guess based on what is not really talked about as much um, and it's thrown under the carpet. So I try to bring out those stories um, to share. Um, I think people, 
for me, I think like the narratives when it comes to my community is so completely wrong. Um, I don't, I, I don't think it's presentable. Um, and it's not much education behind it. And I feel by presenting my stories, I want people to leave with a, an urgency of like a sense of education. Um, so that's how I try to handle, I guess, like my process. Um, I take it day by day and I just try to be so authentic on it, on the process. So. Yeah, as far as like stream or like what kind, I, I tend to, I think, always probably start in stream of consciousness, or I, I think I always start in a sort of fragmented place. Um, and I just, and sometimes I'm like, a, I'm still like a disheveled, you know, artist, and I'm kind of embracing that because no one's yet told me to stop that, or not, I, maybe they ha I haven't listened. So I'll just kind of go bladder it and I'll go back you know so I'll almost kind of go first folio style if I know that I'm in fact writing a play um like because sometimes I'm like maybe this is just a poem maybe this isn't a play maybe this is not to be performed but I'll just go and write a smattering of what I it is that is like aching right and if that aching has continued for probably 20 pages then it's like I'll go back and then separate and then try and dig and excavate and see, oh, who's talking here and you know what that thing is. So process-wise, when I know that I'm writing a play, I'll just kind of just splatter it all on the wall or I'll record myself on my um, iPhone um, or I'll write some notes and hopefully I'll, I'll find those notes again. <laughs> um, and then I will literally come back and go, oh, I think this is all one thing, and then try and parse it all out um, and, and, and make it into a, a thing. Um, and it's like, a, and so the editing process for me is a slow going, tedious process, but the splattering and the whatever is just like a, I just kind of um, go and I'm kind of, the more that I'm writing, the more that I'm embracing that part where I think I used to beat myself up on the like, oh, it's not like, you know, I'm not outlining, I'm not whatever. And 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 I'm sort of embracing, because I work in TV as well, and that's all very organized and all very outlining. So I, I enjoy the fact that in the playwriting process, I, for the most part, so far, <laughs> don't have to do that. Um, so I kind of just really am enjoying the just splattering of it and then coming back to it. Um. There's some questions that relate to um, sort of who you are as humans making the work. You know, Amy Crossman's question, how do you remain compassionate towards yourself as an actor and a human when you've got such a strong inkling of how you want it to go as a writer? You know, uh, Leah Elise Packer's question, are there ever any times where you face low motivation either in your acting or writing? How do you refill your energy and motivation for the crafts? And I, I'm not, I'm only combining questions for time. Um, so this is like about your humanity. How do you protect your humanity as you navigate all of these hats that you wear? I, 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 I'm, I'm, well, for me personally, I always tell people this. I'm an activist for before anything, you know? Um, so I stand up for what I believe in um, and I navigate it from there. So before, before you know, playwright, actress, it's, uh, for me, it's activism first. Um, and it leads me um, and it helps me navigate my work. Um, and as far as, I think it was a question that was interesting. Um, that you had mentioned, Daniela. Uh, I guess I'll come back to it. I, I would have to find it because I wanted to answer it. But yeah, that's that's just for me. I had a one of the most incredible writing teachers I've had is a young woman called Shira Ehrlichman, and um, she's a poet, and she has a book called Odes to Lithium. And uh, the thing that I she's um, 
she's not ushy gushy, but what she said was, "There's no good dog. There's no bad dog. There's just dog. You just show up." Um, and I that 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 helps me. That that to me spoke of compassion, and that's what that yeah, that's what I try and tell myself. I'm like, just just show up. That's all. That actually um, that that reminds me. Uh, that 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 helps me think about what what I what I have to offer to this is that um I have found that writing has afforded me great compassion for myself. You know, when I when I when I write like what I'm ashamed of, you know, what I what, the all of the the stuff that's really hard for me to hold and I read it, I oftentimes find I have compassion for that person. You know, if I can just have the courage to, to express it, to put it down. And sometimes it's like, no, I can't even write it. It's horrible. And then you're like, oh, it's kind of funny. Or, you know, you, you know, you dare to read or I dare to read it to someone. And they're like, oh my God, I, I had that exact same thing happen. And it's such a I mean, writing will, will give you that, I have found. It will gift you back yourself to yourself in a way that is, um, that acting, acting does different things. But I have found, for me, writing is, is such a solace. It's a challenge. It's many things. But it's, and it's dangerous and all, all of, but ultimately, it's, it's such a place of deep, um, uh, comfort. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I think that, uh, I mean, for me anyway, that it's, uh, writing it's, um, I feel it's, I love the process of writing and just sort of, hopefully you get in some sort of med meditation with it. You're just sort of like in this thing, but when you're, you know, sharing it with people, with the world, you know, try to sell it or whatever. It's, it's so exposed. And, um, but I never, and acting is acting, you're incredibly exposed, but it's not the same thing, I guess. Cause if you're, cause it's, when you're writing, it's compositional and it's yours and you start with a blank page and it's all you. And it's just, uh, I, I felt more flattened by rejection in writing than I ever did in acting. And acting, the rejection sucks too, but it's just, uh, it's, it, it's a hard, both are hard roads, man. It's really tough, uh, but they're also great. Uh, so, uh, hold on, sorry, my dog is bothering me. Um, she wants to go out, see, there she is. Yeah, that's Charlotte, everyone. <laughs> So, well, the, the vicious pit bull. Anyway, thank you. Um, I think we have about five minutes left. So what, what's going to happen is um, Larry wants to address the group for about 20 seconds. I want to pose something to the seven of you and give you a second to think about this. And I also wanted to context a little why actors who write at Rattlestick. So the question I want to ask the seven of you to think about, just some brief response if you feel so inclined and Mahira's comment made me think about um, the inspiration from her teacher which is what is a, a line of inspiration that keeps you going something you've heard from a mentor something you've read from a writer you admire just some inspiration that keeps you going as an artist so that's the question I'm going to give you a second to think about while Larry introduces, well, Larry, I give the stage to Larry for a moment to address the group and I give a brief context and we wrap up at 630. Um, okay, Larry, over to you real quick. I'll make it short. So uh, I'm not an actor nor a writer. Uh, I was in TV production, so I'm not the tourist from Kansas coming to see you, but this is a unique situation for me where I get to talk to all of you. And as a, um, I just wanna say that when you feel stuck, when you feel um, you can't get out of your own way. I come to see you because of your courage. And when you tell your truth, it makes it easier for me to see my own. Uh, don't stop. Um, 
I know a little bit of what it takes to be vulnerable night in, night out, day in, day out, at your desk, on the stage, in front of the camera, and I am in awe of what you do. When you think it doesn't make a difference, it does. And don't write for a million people, write for that one person who's in the 16th row that you can't see because the lights are down, who walks out of that smiling, walks out of that theater, that venue, feeling better about himself, or is, is forced to consider other options, other things. And that's what you all do. And I am um, very thankful for what you guys put yourselves through and put out there. So I'm really happy to be here. What? And I can't wait to see what you come up with next. What a gift. Thank you so much for your words. So inspiring. Thank you. So, okay, I guess you could quote Larry if you don't have an answer to my question. <laughs> But in our remaining couple of minutes, do you have any thoughts of things that inspire you just to, to leave with everyone listening? Yeah, I had a, um, a teacher once and I still to this day don't know if it was a negative or positive statement, but it was a teach, and I think now it was positive, at least for me. It was a teacher who told me I didn't make sense when, when, when they were telling me about what my, they saw for my future. And he was like, I don't know. I don't know that you make sense. I've never seen you before, essentially. Um, and so I don't know what to tell you where your place is, you know? But I also don't, but I think, you know, and that's all he said. And I, I didn't, I never let that discourage me. It was more like, one, you probably need to go see more, <laughs> or it was also like, then I have to do this. You know what I mean? Because I'm doing this for the people who have never seen me. Cause I know, but I know I'm not by myself. I know I'm not the first person like me. And I know I shouldn't be the last person like me. So I should throw myself out there to encourage the people like me, whether they look like me or essence wise feel like me. Um, so that the many me's, <laughs> you know, um, feel inspired. So yeah, that was actually helpful. Thank you for sharing. Does anyone else feel like sharing? Yeah. Um, Joe Frazier's always been one of my heroes and he just kept moving forward and, you know, got knocked down, got up and when it gets, when it gets bad, I, I think if I've got a lot of pictures of him in my apartment and Ali actually, and, uh, you know, I'll go to him a lot. So so and he just kept on charging forward and you know never gave up so for those of you know joe frazier thank you rob that's awesome yeah. i love this idea that um and, and it goes to a little bit to the question about motivation um if it's this idea that um that what you write or what you act what you create wants to reach you it wants to come through you that there's a story that's inside you, but it also already exists. And you need to open yourself. Yes, you need to apply yourself, you need to sit, but then you need something that, that wants badly to be expressed. So it's more like you have to do less of like making something up and more about surrendering and allowing all the stuff that wants to come through. That that's helpful for me. Yes, yeah. I um riffing on that is a, a little book called The Alchemist, and um, one of the things that really stuck with me is that when when you come up with a with a want, with an ask, with a desire, uh, just know that the entire universe is conspiring to help you. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I uh, I love what Mira Nair says, where she's like, I didn't come here to melt into the melting pot. <laughs> Keith or Cece, do either of you want to jump in? I think you're waiting for each other. 
I think I go. go. <laughs> I had written something that I was going to present today, and I wrote it today, but uh, I didn't read that because I, I've been angry since Sunday. And uh, so this thing that my mouth, which is known both prayer and curses, does not bite itself and is often called to its courage and had it answer. It kind of uh, sends me to uh, my laptop uh, because that's the place I could be courageous. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. And Cece, did you want to share anything? Inspiration? Um, I've just been angry. I've been very angry within the past 48 hours. Another senseless murder in my community. Um, another life taken. And it just has to stop. It just really has to stop. Um, then another young life was taken again on national TV. We all saw what we saw within the past 24 hours. I'm just, I'm just broken, I'm upset. And I know um, I'm gonna use my activism to really, to really put a light up on any, the couch tonight. So hold on to your wigs, everyone. <laughs> because my social media is going to be on fire. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that, Cece. Thank you also for sharing, Keith. And you are our leaders. Your activism, your writing, your artistry, it's, we need this. We will follow you. And um, I, I know I didn't mean to speak on the we, but I'm just going to speak on the we right now and say that we need this. We need you. Um, so um, thank you for the gift that you've all given us. Um, you seven wonderful actor, writers, beautiful artists, activists. And thank you, um, wonderful audience of artists for sharing time and space together and let us continue on the journey together. Um, namaste.